All right, good morning everyone. Happy Earth Day, Dolphin Island Sea Lab here. My name is Greg Graber and I'm one of the Sea Lab educators here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab in the Discovery Hall programs. And we are super excited to be celebrating Earth Day with y'all with two Facebook Live events today. We're starting off the day talking about one of my favorite topics and what got me interested in marine science and that is sharks. And then at one o'clock this afternoon, we have Grant Lockridge and technical diving and diving in science here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab coming up at one o'clock today. So we appreciate embracing the Gulf today with GOMA and we're gonna chat about how I got into this. But really we're talking about sharks of the Gulf of Mexico. And if you tuned in a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Chris did a great job of common sharks in the Gulf of Mexico and helping you kind of differentiate those common sharks. But what we're going into is sharks and their other relatives and that sort of thing that will link everybody kind of back together looking at species common in the Gulf. All right, feel free to ask questions in the comment section. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I have a feeling there'll be a few. So with that, we will go ahead and get going. And so whenever you gotta talk about sharks and you're talking about just a basic shark, you gotta talk about sharks in terms of, again, being a vertebrate, an animal with a backbone, all right? And not only are they a vertebrate, but they're in a select group of fishes that only number about 1,250, which sounds like a lot, but there are a lot of species of animals, so if you have about a thousand of sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras and their cousins, that's a pretty small group of animals. And so when you're looking at the vertebrates, one of their distant relatives is where this group of vertebrates kind of begins. And that's this weird looking thing that we'll focus on probably a little bit later in an invasive species talk, but this is what is called a lamprey. And you can see how it gets the name a jawless fish because of this jaw that looks really creepy, and it's pretty creepy, um, cannot move, cannot close, and it is a vertebrate though, because there is the backbone, all right? Now, one of the things people do know about sharks and skates and rays is that they belong to a group of fishes, as does this guy, that really don't have bones, even though they have a spine, all right? Their skeletons are made of cartilage, which makes sharks and skates and rays different from a bass, a brim, or even a red snapper. And so this lamprey right here with its jawless fish is kind of in its own group with another thing called a hagfish that starts out true vertebrates, all right, with spines and backbones. But as you move up things with cartilaginous skeletons, that's when you hit the sharks. All right, and so common coastal sharks that were touched on by Mr. Chris Flight a couple of weeks ago, definitely the most common around here would be this guy, which is what is known as an Atlantic sharp nosed shark that Chris mentioned briefly. And so you can tell by a couple of different things, but the easiest way, and this one has seen better days, but it's got white freckles, kind of dim freckles on its body. And those freckles help differentiate that from say something of a similar size like this guy, which is called a spinner shark, all right? And so that spinner shark, common coastal shark, it's got a black tip on this fin, and that tells you that it's a spinner shark versus a black tip, which sounds kind of silly. This guy has black tips on all of its fins, just about, and the black tip lacks a black tip here, which gets really confusing. But one of the things that people do know about sharks and fishes in general is that if you're gonna talk fish, you're gonna talk sharks, you gotta talk a little bit about the body of a shark. And so one of the neat things in a small group of animals, sharks only number about 450-ish species. And so they have a lot of different changes to their body shape and different ways that they've adapted to living in the water, all right? But fish have fins, that's one of the things people know. And so if you're looking at the body shape of any fish, they generally have the same fins, all right? Some will be left off in some fish, some will be added or longer or taller. But the point is, is that when you look at the shape of a fish, you start at the top, the dorsal side, the back side, and that is the dorsal fin. If you think jaws swimming through the water, that's the fin that's at the top of the water. And then you move back to generally the smaller one, but again, like those rules in English and stuff, not everybody follows the exact same rule. So some of them don't have a secondary dorsal fin, 
but they do have a tail fin. They have a caudal fin, and one of the things that makes a shark a shark is this cool, what we call heterocircial or heterocircal top lobe much larger than the bottom lobe of a shark, as opposed to a bass or a brim or something like that, where they're in generally the same shape. Now, with this, not all sharks have that. In fact, the fastest fish in the world, for example, like a mako shark or a great white, their tail fins are almost the same top to bottom in length, all right? So it looks like a crescent moon, and that's how they get the name a lunate tail, okay? But if you move closer to the bottom, some sharks have it, some sharks don't. This is the anal fin right here. It's down below. And then one of the more important fins is the one that's on the bottom that we know as a pelvic fin right here. And that pelvic fin in sharks and skates and rays is very important because this will tell you whether it is a male or a female, a boy or a girl. And so this caudal fin, I mean, I'm sorry, this pelvic fin right here will allow you to know from birth, just like a, hurt, uh, just like a human, that we are male or female in the shark. So this one right here, the fins look like all of the other fins, and so this would be a girl, all right? And what she lacks are two small finger-like projections called claspers. And if it's got claspers, it's a boy, and if it doesn't, it's a girl. So I believe this one's a great example. Here is a boy. All right, so those claspers tell you that this shark was a male, okay? And so as you continue on, just because this is such an easy shark to look at and it's got big ones, then you move forward again, and that's when you hit what we call the pectoral fins. We've got pectoral muscles. Some people, I don't, but some people do, um, have pectoral muscles, and these are the pectoral fins. Those are the wings, okay? It controls where it is within the water. And then as you keep moving forward, Sharks, unlike bony fish, have gill slits. And the general number is one, two, three, four, five gill slits. But again, there are always exceptions to the rule. And in a little bit, we'll get to one of those exceptions, which is, for us, exceptionally rare to find around us. All right. Then you can see their eye. Sharks can see pretty well. There's been some recent studies shown that they don't see color uh, very well, as we initially thought. And then you can get to the swimming nose right here, the shark nose that everybody knows so much about. And there was a really cool talk on the web yesterday about can a shark smell blood in a billion gallons of water and stuff. But we do know that they use that nose quite a lot to be able to swim, okay? And so with that, one of the other things that differentiates sharks from other fishes is you maybe have heard Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, or Wild Kratts talk about shark skin, all right, and the scales that sharks possess versus those of a bass or a brim. And so if you pet a shark from head to tail, sharks generally swim forward, okay? Now, with that shark swimming forward, their skin is incredibly smooth, okay? However, one of the things that is well known about sharks around the world is that sharks feel like sandpaper. Well, they do, and we might be able to hear it in this boomy room. You can hear the sandpapery sound as opposed to the nothing sound. And that sandpapery skin is one of the more interesting things about sharks and skates and rays is that those are tiny microscopic teeth, okay? And those tiny microscopic teeth that are known as dermal skin, like a dermatologist, denticle teeth, like a dentist, those skin teeth actually derive one of the things that everybody knows about sharks is that sharks have a lot of teeth, all right? And so if you're talking about sharks and their teeth, they are impressive. And one of the fun things about them is that they are one of the most common fossils in our vertebrate fossil record, animals with backbones again, because of that thing about sharks having a conveyor belt of teeth. Well, they really do. And so you can see this bull shark that was from the Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo years ago. That was uh, given to us for science. We took samples of it, did all the research on that, and you could see the rows of teeth. Now, when one falls out, it is true, the one right behind it would simply move up and take its place. So when you've been around for millions of years, that's a lot of shark teeth, and they could shed this whole mouth multiple times, and as that mouth is shed, 
it would still have all of these teeth in it, which is one of the impressive things about sharks that some people know. And for the first time really in a long time, we have a new beach out. And if you tuned in yesterday, Lauren was out on our beach, thanks to the Dolphin Island Police Department letting us out on the beach, we could find shark teeth on our shorelines now, as opposed to before when uh, it was very, very, very rare to find those. So shark teeth and shark skin are actually closely related. And it's one of the things that makes sharks sharks. So with that, as you continue on talking about sharks and skates and rays, we mentioned that a typical shark like this bull shark is very sharky. All right. But their diversity is actually pretty impressive. And as you go through one of the common sharks that people know well, just because of their strangeness is something like a hammerhead. Okay. And so the hammerhead sharks are a shark. And the way you know, it's a shark and not a ray or a skate is that the gills are actually on the side. All right. So when we get to our rays or our skate, for example, right next to it, gills are on the side and a shark rays and skates have gills on their stomachs. So that's how you actually know. So when you start getting into the ultra weird, and we'll get back to the hammerhead shark, when you start getting into the ultra weird sharks like this guy, the gills are on the side. They are not underneath the shark. So this is an angel shark, not a ray, even though it's very flat. As you can see, this is an angel shark and it's the one that's the opposite of everybody else where the bottom lobe is longer than the top lobe on that caudal fin for it to sit flat. And it's a major predator. And we, we can check out the teeth on that guy in just a little bit. But back to the hammerhead sharks and their strangeness, this is the smallest of all the hammerheads on the planet. This is a common coastal shark that is easy to differentiate because of the rounded head. And this is what we know as a bonnet head. Uh, you maybe have seen these in aquariums swimming around, small hammerheads swimming around. Well, that small hammerhead is not really a small hammerhead. If it's this big or bigger, you mostly have a full grown animal, which is different than most people think of the sharks as these big giant creatures, but full grown, this fish is only about this big when it is alive. All right. And so the bonnet head feeds almost exclusively on blue crabs and lots of crustaceans. So it loves some of the stuff that Joanne talked about a couple of weeks ago. If you tune into our YouTube channel, you could listen to talks about crustaceans and, and shrimp and crabs. Well, that's what this one eats. And so much so that if you look at its gut, sometimes when you dissect it to learn about it, you'll actually see the crab spikes sticking out of the sides and sticking up in the belly because their bellies are so full, but they'll also eat shrimp and the cool mantis shrimp people have heard of on Discovery Channel as well. So this is the bonnet head, the smallest of the hammerheads, but they don't stay small. And so even though you have a baby here and this is a baby, this is where they start getting large and hammerheads are prized for their very large fins in relationship to their body size. And so hammerheads grow quite large. Great hammerheads can get 12 to 15 feet long. Um, their mouth is incredibly small compared to the rest of the body. And in some cases of other sharks, despite the large head, its mouth is actually pretty small and they're very slender. So a long hammerhead might not weigh nearly as much as a short, thick bull shark because of how dense this body is versus how skinny this body is. And so there are multiple species of hammerheads and it all has to do with what kind of shape the head makes. And so in this case, we have a couple of scallops, hammerheads, and the big one is the great hammerhead. But one of the fun things about hammerheads at this size is that hammerheads give birth to live young just like humans do. And so if you look closely right here, there is a little black dot, little brown dot. That is the belly button of a shark. All right. Which is pretty darn weird because most people don't think that sharks have belly buttons, but they were really given birth to just like we were. They had a placenta. They had an umbilical cord connected to mama. And this is that scar. Now in the bigger sharks as adults, they don't keep that belly button. It actually grows closed. And so it's difficult to see it later on in life. But sharks are interesting in that 
They can, some can lay eggs called mermaid's purses that you can find around shorelines. And then some are even weirder. And Chris touched on this a lot where they develop inside of the mom outside of an egg and some of them eat each other on the inside. But most of the time they feed on the eggs of the mom rather than each other when they are um, about to uh, give birth to so they can get big because they're not connected to mom and they're not connected to an egg anymore. So they got to get food to develop and the mom will make eggs and they'll feed on them. All right, which is kind of neat. So as you get away from uh, hammerheads and the common coastal sharks, you get to some that people have definitely heard of and seen before. And that is something like a tiger shark, one of the prettiest fish in the world. This is a juvenile tiger shark and you gotta see them when they're small. Um, really, um, with the dots, it probably should be a jaguar or a cheetah shark or something like that because the stripes aren't much for stripes. They're more dots and lines, but this is a juvenile young tiger shark, which has made a lot of news down here uh, at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab because our researcher uh, here at the lab that was at the lab for a while moved next door to Mississippi. Notice that sharks this size to about this size that are tiger sharks love this time of year just like all the bird watchers do around here. And so a juvenile tiger shark about this big, we found out that they like backyard songbirds. Wherever you're tuning in from via Facebook, those warblers that people are looking at right now, the indigo buntings I saw yesterday, the birds from your backyard wind up in the stomachs of baby tiger sharks, which is pretty interesting because it's not the Saturday Night Live land shark coming to eat them. It is the juveniles coming back for the migration seasons in the fall and in the spring and the ones, the birds that weren't healthy enough or didn't get fat enough, didn't get energy enough, they fell out of the sky. And we were teaching a teacher workshop uh, last summer, summer before last, and we caught a juvenile tiger shark to tag and release and we actually put a hose in its throat ran water in its gut, turned it upside down, and the only thing that fell out of its mouth were bird feathers. Not a seagull, not a pelican, not a tern, backyard songbirds, so really cool. So we knew something was really weird when they, when, like Sylvester or Tweety, the t baby tiger shark about eight or 10 years ago coughed up a big old plume of feathers and none of them were our typical coastal sharks. So tiger shark around here is our largest predator for sure. We do get great whites in the Gulf of Mexico. Our Sea Lab research and our researchers here that tag sharks, we've never actually caught a great white, but we have caught several large uh, tiger sharks. Uh, most of them though are juveniles from about small like this up to about eight to 10 feet or so, when a tiger shark can easily be 15 feet or more and weigh 1,500 pounds. So pretty neat stuff. So that's a juvenile tiger shark. And then you start getting to the weird ones. So we briefly touched on the angel shark looking at the gills and it being flat. Well, the whole idea of this fish is that it sits on the bottom, waits for other fish to swim, and we call that an ambush predator as they swim by and this shark will eat them. And if you look closely, it's got a lot of really sharp teeth to swallow fishes as they are swimming by buried in the sand. It does have a couple of whiskers like a catfish does, and they are really rough because they're not made to swim fast. So they're really rough kind of all over. They just feel like sandpaper. And one of their adaptations, as we'll see in its cousins, are the holes on top of its head. And these big holes on top of its head are what we call Sphericals, and those are modified gills. So as it's sitting on the bottom, it doesn't get dirt and sand and uh, nasty stuff in its gills. It can pull it in, breathe, and move that water back out of its gills. And so that takes you back to a point that a lot of people think they know about sharks is that sharks have to swim their entire life. And the answer is, is that most sharks swim their entire life, but not all for sure. And if they stop swimming, they don't immediately die, they sink, all right? And if they don't start swimming again, then they could die. But this shark, for example, and things you've seen at aquariums like nurse sharks that look like overgrown catfish with the two big whiskers, those are 
bottom dwelling sharks and they don't have to swim their entire life. They've developed the muscles to be able to pump uh, water across the gills. All right, so angel sharks are pretty interesting. And then you move over to the definitely weirder ones. And here's one of those exceptions to the shark rule. We went over all the fins, but what you'll notice quickly is it's only got one on the top. All right, it's only got one dorsal fin, and this is one of the rarer fish that we have caught in our research. This is a deep water six gill shark, because remember, sharks have five for the most part, but one, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, this, this is the seven gill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven gills. So, cool stuff. And so, with that, this is one of the stranger ones, but you got to see this mouth because this mouth is one of the oddest and kind of creepiest of the shark mouths around. And so you can see the bottom teeth so much different than those really, really sharp, gnarly top teeth right here. So that is definitely a difference. And when we pulled in this shark, this shark's eyeball was growing neon, glowing, just neon green bright, bright, bright green, looking like an alien coming up out of the water when we pulled it up. So those deep water sharks are probably one of the largest fish we've ever tagged uh, or were close to tagging. It fell right off like an old fish story, right? We had it, I promise, but it was right off the side of the boat um, in the early mornings and estimate size was about 15 feet um, pulling up on the side of our boat doing research. So as you move away from sharks, you get to their cousins, all right? And so sharks and their cousins are what we know as rays and skates. And so one that kind of looks like a shark, but is not a shark, is one of the rarer fish around here for us. We used to catch a few a year. That's why we still have a few to be able to show off. But I've been here for about 17 years now, and I've never seen a live one out on our research boats or any of that. This is what is known as a guitar fish. And it is kind of a cross between a shark and a ray. And in other parts of the country and the world especially, these things are known as shark rays, actually, because they look like a cross between those. But this is a guitar fish, and you know it's not a shark because the gills are on the bottom right here. But it definitely has that goofy, meme-like face right there, the smiley face. So it's got its nostrils on the bottom, its teeth in the mouth, and then, again, the eyes and those sphericals that are those modified gills to keep it on the bottom, all right? So really, really a cool critter known as a guitar fish that most people don't really know exists, but they are definitely here, all right? And so as you move along, another critter that is a cousin of a shark that people don't really think exists is this guy, all right? And so before we started, someone asked if this was an eel, all right? And the eel, is not an eel. Remember, it's a lamprey. An eel is a bony fish. But whenever we hold up this fish or an eel, people always ask, is it going to shock you? And the answer is, is we don't live in the Amazon River around here. So we don't have electric eels. However, if you want a truly electrifying experience at the beach, shocking even, then what you'll get step on is this guy. And this is what is called an electric ray. All right, and the electric ray has this definitely meme looking face. It looks terrifying. Um, but what it also has are these honeycomb like butter bean shapes. And this is where they produce electrical shocks. Now, when you talk about electricity and sharks, one of the other things you may be able to see are all of these little black dots on the white skin of this electric ray. That is what all of these species have around their heads, and that is what we know as the ampullae of Lorenzini. One of the shark's extra cool things that they can do is feel electromagnetic pulses. So they can feel your heartbeat inside of your chest by using these jelly-filled sacs that are one of the most electrical sensitive substances on the planet, all right? So really, really neat but they're not the most electrically sensitive. Supposedly, fun fact if you didn't know, the duck-billed platypus uh, has a better electrical sense than 
sharks and skates and rays. So this is an electric ray and it really does shock. I've been slightly shocked a little bit over the years, probably explains a lot in this video, but last summer I got shocked by one and uh, it was uh, an interesting sensation to say the least. So they, they produce quite a charge when they want to, to protect themselves or to stun prey to be able to eat. And with that goofy looking small mouth that you saw, their favorite prey, worms. All right, they love worms. So electric rays, pretty neat, all right? So as you move away from the electrical ones, you get the ones that people definitely know. And of course, those are stingrays, right? And so if you're a stingray, you should have a sting or a barb. And sure enough, this guy's got a Barb. Now, the thing about stingrays and the common ones around here would be an Atlantic, Southern, and then lesser would be a blunt nose. And this one is a Southern stingray. If you've ever been lucky enough to go to Stingray City and dive with them like you see on commercials, the Southern stingrays are the big ones that are around. But the stinger and the sting of a ray is sheathed in venom. You break the sheath, the venom is injected, and generally they only do it in the event that they are stepped on. It's a protective measure, all right? Now, does it hurt? Yes, really bad, all right, as it stings. You swear your leg's gonna fall off. One of the things that they're only gonna do for you, for the most part, at the emergency room is if you get stabbed, they're gonna put your foot in the hottest water you can stand because it breaks down the toxin under heat, okay, is what they're gonna do. Now, if it breaks off in your foot, that's a different problem because it's made to go in easily because it's sharp at the tip, but it's made serrated backwards. So it only goes in one way easily. And that is a ray. Now, their big predator is that hammerhead shark. All right. And so like in sharks my entire life, since I was in elementary school, reading a book years ago, there was some big, large hammerhead years ago. And it's just one of those facts that sticks in your head is that it had 70 something stingray barbs in its stomach when they dissected that large adult great hammerhead. All right, so um, this is our very common southern stingray and they get quite large. People ask, what's the biggest thing you've ever caught? Well, I've seen rays this large uh, as wide as one of these tables. So six feet, eight feet. I'm 6'2", so about as wide as I am tall uh, when we've been out before. So with that, um, other rays that we have are some of the rays that don't sit on the bottom, and those are the flying rays, like what you saw our aquarist Logan feeding a few weeks ago during our sharks and rays uh, talk at the estuarium across the street, the aquarium, and spotted eagle rays, much rarer. In fact, I caught my first one in 17 years last year. Um, down here at the lab. This is a spotted eagle ray, one of the prettiest animals. This one's been around the block for a while, um, teaching thousands and thousands of kids what a spotted eagle ray is. But here is its cousin that's much more common. And we had a student years ago, a PhD, uh, Dr. Ajamian, who studied cow nose rays populations around here. So these are flying rays. They swim, and this one will school in the thousands. If you want a cool Google after this, Google cow nose rays schools, and you'll see thousands of these swimming in a massive school of rays. Again, they do have a stinger, but it's right next to the body. So there's very little play. It's swimming its entire life. The only time this guy can hurt someone with a barb is if it is in the mouth of something for the most part, strictly for protection, okay? And then wrapping it up is sharks cousins and rays cousins that get much less press and that is called a skate, all right? So skates, sharks and rays, cartilaginous fishes and then what we don't have many of around here, you gotta go into the deep sea, are Chimeras. So here is a skate, and the skate's claim to fame around here is I mentioned that sharks can lay eggs. Well, around here, we don't find shark eggs like you do in other parts of the world. We find skate eggs, and those skate eggs are well known as mermaid's purses, and those mermaid's purses are the eggs that these guys hatch out of. There's actually one across the room. Um, but I don't have one right here with me. But 
The skate also has that meme looking face and you can see the teeth. The teeth are in plates and they're for crushing things just like in a stingray and so they are harmless. They don't have a stinger but what they do have instead is they have a thorny body. They're very, very rough. Remember those dermal denticles, those skin teeth? Well, these guys turn it into kind of a briar patch on their tail. And unlike rays, they have two fins. They have two dorsal fins. And then the main characteristic, people always ask, what's the difference between a skate and a ray? The telltale sign is a double lobed pelvic fin. Remember the pelvic fin, how to tell if it's a male or a female or a boy or a girl. This is not a male or a female because of this, it would still have claspers. And so this one is a girl because it lacks the claspers, but it's a skate because it's got two lobes. All right. So that's how you know a skate versus a ray. Okay. And so with that, as a quick overview, skim over of sharks and skates and rays commonly in the Gulf of Mexico. Do we have any questions? We got lots. I so figured. We'll start. Okay. Let's so, knock them out. Aubrey wants to know the distance a shark can smell blood. That is a great question. So it is dependent on ocean currents. It's dependent on what direction the shark is moving versus where those currents are, where things start. You know, there's all kinds of numbers that are thrown out there, but the answer is, is that they can smell really, really well. The distance of miles and that sort of thing definitely would have to do with the concentration of the amount of blood or whatever it happens to be smelling along with its ability to diffuse. Um, through the water to move that smell throughout the water to be able to track it. Okay. So that's kind of an important factor in following those smells. Is it being able to move throughout the water to initially be able to get the smell? Leo wants to know how long can sharks live? Okay. That is a great question and super cool research within the last week or so that just came out is whale sharks, the biggest fish in the sea. They just were using nuclear testing for age of sharks and the age of whale sharks more specifically because they're long lived. And so sharks can live a really long time. The Greenland shark that lives in the Arctic and actually can live in the Gulf of Mexico. There was video of Greenland slash sleeper sharks at the bottom of gas rigs in the deep sea in the Gulf of Mexico about 10 or 12 years ago. 200 years maybe? Crazy stuff. There was a great white aged a few years ago with um, that was about 70 years. So sharks versus regular fish with bones. We had Justin talk about the bones inside a shark inside of a fish's head. So a red snapper, an amberjack, a bass or a brim. Sharks don't have those bones. So to age a shark, you got to go back to that vertebrae. You got to pull their vertebrae out and then you can section it and, li and they lay down generally growth rings as well. All right. Which is kind of fun. So you got to use their vertebrae. Mrs. Hurst has brought her entire class to join us. Hi, Angie. Um, and she, the class wants to know why sharks are afraid of dolphins. All right. So we had a talk last week about dolphins and somebody asked that same question. And the answer is, um, they live in the same place. They inhabit the same habitat. They eat the same food. And I'll never forget 15, 12, uh, 16 years ago in the summertime during our month long high school summer course, we were going red snapper fishing. It was too windy. So we went up into Mobile Bay. When we went up into Mobile Bay, we had our fishing rods ready and everything else. And we were pulling our trawl to see what was in the bottom of Mobile Bay. When we were pulling that trawl, there must have been 50 shark fins, sharks swimming in and out, catching food out of our net. 10, 15 feet behind the line of shark fins was another 15 or 20 pot of dolphins feeding out of the back of our net in the same habitat, in the same place, eating the same food, and none of them were eating each other. All right. So, they are predators. They can eat sharks. Dolphins can, sharks can eat dolphins. It's a you eat each other kind of thing in that natural world. So the bigger ones will generally win. All right. 
So that is not necessarily the case as a common myth. If you see dolphins at the beach, you're not going to see sharks. That's not the case at all. Uh, Madeline, who's seven, wants to know how sharks are born. How sharks are born, just like us. All right, they have a multi-purpose organ called a cloaca, and that is what is between that pelvic fin. Let me find an easy shark. So they are born just like us. So this bull shark was born. This is a male, so obviously he would not have babies because he has the tiny little claspers right here, but this is a young bull shark right here. So they are born just like us. Uh, Emma Ray would like to know if sharks live in schools. If sharks live in schools, sure, some of them do. And if you um, watch some of the um, shark documentaries, hammerheads are well known for schooling in the thousands, migrating together in massive schools, divers sitting on the bottom and just watching the hammerheads swim above them as they are moving around. Um, other ones, as I mentioned before, again, a cool Google is Calnose rays. They swim in massive, massive schools together and they migrate huge distances in these huge schools. And if you Google it, there's some really neat videos and some pictures that are just fascinating of how many Calnose rays as well can be in a school. Good question. Um, Colleen wants to know, how do hammerhead sharks eat such big fish if they have small mouths? That's a great question as well. And they eat big fish like rays because they actually hurt the ray first. All right, and they eat tarpon and other things as well. But you gotta think, so this is a baby shark doot do, right? So this is a little one. But if you're talking about a 15 foot one with a hammer that's four feet wide, its mouth is still big. But in relationship to its skinny body, this guy could easily eat a tarpon, a big fish. But when you're talking about large rays like this, cow, uh, like this southern stingray right here, when it's buried in the sand and they're doing their metal detector find, they will take a bite out of it and harm it, damage it, take a bite out of it, and then they'll follow it. And then they'll feed on it a little bit more because obviously it's not going to be able to put this whole fish in its mouth at one time. All right, but they can take large chunks of food off their prey at a time. Uh, Eileen asks, how many teeth does a shark have? As many as it needs. Thousands and thousands. There's no number. And again, when you look at it, and it doesn't matter what kind of shark it is, you can even go down to something as small as this little baby spinner shark. When they are born or hatched, they're sharks and they have teeth and they're ready to feed, all right, immediately. So those teeth will lose um, constantly, daily. And so you can see the size of the spinner shark, size of the mouth they will lose literally thousands of teeth in their life. And that's why they're so common to find as fossils. Sharks are very old. They have tons of teeth. They lose those teeth constantly and we can find them everywhere. Alabama is one of the best places in the world to find shark teeth. We took 20 teachers 10 years ago, a hundred miles away from the beach near Andalusia, Alabama. Every teacher went away with about 20 to 30 shark teeth for their class um, 100 miles away from the beach. So pretty neat stuff. We actually have a researcher up in Birmingham who is a shark tooth researcher at McWayne Center. His name is June Ebersol. He just described a brand new shark species by its teeth from right here in Alabama last year. So super cool stuff. Cammie asks, how large is the largest ray that we that we have on the planet. Uh, largest rays are the manta rays, the giant manta rays. Back before overfishing, manta rays could grow 25 feet wide and weigh 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pounds. So if you think about it in terms of like a basketball goal or a basketball hoop or a three-point line on a basketball court, they could be wider than the three-point line on a basketball court from the goal. Um. That, that is dependent on what the shark is eating and how they're feeding. So it, some years is easy, and that's when you can see growth rings quickly. Some years are lean. Fish are hard to come by. You're just surviving. So it all depends on what you're eating. Um, Marianne asks, I've heard that embryo sharks will fight for life against each other while in the mother shark. Is that true? That is very true. That is in the sand tiger shark. That is the sand tiger shark, not this tiger shark. 
This is simply a tiger shark, not a sand tiger shark, and not a sand shark, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Mr. Chris. They will. That is what we call in utero cannibalism, and they will. But that's only in one shark. Most of the sharks that do a similar thing, they eat the eggs rather than their brothers and sisters. They eat the mother's eggs that she produces. Uh, Kimberly asks, which shark is the smallest in the world? That is a great shark. That is a great question. There is uh, a dwarf pygmy shark that's about the size of a hand, full grown. Amanda said, thank you so much for the live programs. Um, you got it. That's what we're trying so, to do. Mrs. Hurst class, how many times can sharks have babies? That is a great question. They alternate um, years most of the time. And so they can have multiple batches of babies, but they generally will alternate every other year or every every other year. They generally don't produce young every year. And also from Mrs. Hurst class, how long can they stop before they die? No, nobody really knows exactly, you know, whether sharks sleep and if they coast and that sort of thing. So the point is, is that depending on the species of shark, high metabolism versus lower metabolism sharks, makos and, and poor beagles and salmon sharks that are fast swimmers, they probably can't handle very much of not swimming for very long at all because they have to constantly oxygenate these big, strong muscles as opposed to something that might be more of a bottom dwelling, um, but still a shark that is swimming constantly, maybe a gray reef or something like that. But I don't know exactly. Um, Cammie asks, how much poison can a ray inject in someone? Oh, that's a good question. Um, once the sheath is broken, the tube that's around the, the, uh, the venom, the venom that's around the spike, um, it will simply put what is in that sheath into that person all right so they can then regenerate if this breaks off it's very similar to a fingernail in that it can grow back and so at our aquarium across the street we have to net them in our aquarium and clip the barbs every few months as they continue to grow back so they can continue to grow the venom as well all right so they have a venom sack that they can grow uh, produce and our last question um is from Eileen, how does the electric ray shock you? Okay, that's a great question. So the butter bean organs are the shocking organs that we talked about that look like a butter bean right here with the honeycomb. But what it does is it actually stores, just like an electric eel, they store the electrical impulses of the body, the heart beats, the muscle twitches, all of that like an alternator in a car, and they send that electrical impulse to these structures right here. Very cool. So there's probably a couple more questions and Greg will jump in and answer them Yep. for you on this Earth Day. So Greg, you want to give a shout out and a goodbye? Yeah. So thanks a lot for tuning in to the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. We've got tons of digital content coming up uh, throughout the week. We have a Zoom event on Friday with Discovery Hall as well. And then this afternoon, we've got Grant Lockridge talking about scientific diving and how we explore the oceans using that scientific diving this afternoon. So please continue to tune in. We're grateful that you are tuning in and we hope that you're learning stuff over the last couple of weeks that we've been pushing out all of this information to bring the ocean to you when unfortunately you can't make it to the ocean and neither can we really. So we appreciate your time and thanks a lot to Embracing the Gulf and Embrace the Gulf and Goma. And happy Earth Day, everyone.